Hello. All right, I am recording. Please type in present. Um, announcements. As far as grading, I think we should be catching up. Um, if there's anything that's uh, unduly outstanding, please let me know. Or let's well, let me know. I can follow up with Siraj. All right. Any questions? Oh, so I did a little more research on that incognito um, mode and everything oh, okay. else. And uh, so I was, it's much different than I was thinking. And there's like several, I was thinking of several things at the same time. Mm -hmm. So uh, incognito for Google is similar to what you were talking about, where basically they don't track any of your activity with cookies or anything like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, but ultimately other like, they, your IP address and everything else is still intact. It, that doesn't change. But what I was thinking of um, is uh, there's several of them out there now, and some you can actually pay for, but it's just a virtual private network. Mm -hmm. um, and they basically set it up to where it pings off. Uh, so there's a free version that, that this group came up with. Um, I'm, I can't remember for, for some reason, I can't remember what it's called right now. Um, that basically just pings it all over the world. So that it can obscure your IP address, um, mm -hmm. and they also have like an option that also removes cookies and everything else with that. So that's supposed to be kind of more of like a private setup for it. But yeah, so turns out it was a VPN all along. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for following up on that. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Great. All right. Um, let's get into the lecture then. All right, uh, so today we are getting into uh, multimedia, which is basically how multimedia traffic is transmitted, stored and transmitted over the internet. <clears throat> so ideally, everyone's connection to the home would look like this, at least from a network engineer's perspective, where you would have just giant fiber going into your house and uh, no one would ever need to worry about bandwidth. Um, unfortunately, that does not happen. This is actually a sewage pipe. So um, what we need to do is to be able to transmit multimedia traffic that likes a lot of bandwidth um, with somewhat thinner network connections. All right, so first of all, before we even get to encoding, um, we need to think about how to provide enough uh, capacity into the homes. And this is something that gets done by network providers who deploy the network to provide a service that is, uh, if not ideal, at least satisfactory to you. Okay? Um, so what we can do is, uh, if we have a lot of bandwidth, we can have low complexity into mechanisms, but uh, transmit a lot of data. Or we can do uh, something, something smarter if we have better encoding. So kind of provisioning uh, or dimensioning networks depends on the type of traffic that uh, network operators expect will be transmitted. All right, And so here is kind of two uh, aspects to designing a network. One is bandwidth provisioning, the other one is bandwidth dimensioning. Okay? So for bandwidth provisioning, the question is how to deploy the right amount of data, uh, the right amount of bandwidth, right? And the question there is how much bandwidth is enough? Um, what do you guys think? What is I mean, enough I'm bandwidth? I mean, it's very subjective to what they're pulling, um, how many users are on there and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, anybody else? How would you how would you determine what's what's enough bandwidth? I would imagine that enough bandwidth is the amount to where you can manage everything that you're trying to do without any sort of latency or uh, buffering and stuff like that, any sort of interference, not necessarily interference, but 
um, preventing like lag, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it depends um, on how media is encoded, right? How I, much different different data applications use. Yeah. I guess for me, the question would be, for whom? For whom? That's. For even within the same organization, two different people can have completely different needs. That is very, that is very true. Um, so, uh, I, I, I guess it'd be nice if, if we could, uh, if people were, if network operators were smart enough and be able to trade off bandwidth against people that don't use it though, they sort of do. If bandwidth is unused, right, it goes to the people that need it or there's not capacity for other people. So this sort of takes care of itself in, in a sense, right? But you can say that, well, it's sort of the amount of bandwidth depends on the applications that people are using. Okay, so then there's the question of, well, how much bandwidth can we actually use? Right? And there are some limits to that, right? For example, if, if you look at all our senses, right, eyes, ears, etc., um, I guess we don't have much of in terms of tactile internet at this point, and smell of vision didn't make it. Um, right? How much data can we actually consume? Because there's no sense delivering, you know, something like 24k if people can't even see 8k very well, right? Um, so we are kind of approaching the limits of what one person can consume on a screen. Um, now. This may go away because there are many different devices in a home that can start consuming more bandwidth, right? For example, uploading security video. So just as we're reaching the maybe saturation point of how much bandwidth does one person need, um, we're about to get hit by the bandwidth demands of devices that we deploy around us. Right? So we kind of become these cyborgs, or at least our homes become uh, more intelligent machines. Right? Um, so it depends on traffic demands uh, in the aggregate from the from the operator's perspective. The other question is network dimensioning, which is is the bandwidth in the right places? And if you're gonna develop, if you're gonna deploy 100 kilobits per second or 100 megabits per second to every single home around Bozeman, well, then you need to think about the capacity of the link that takes the data from Bozeman to other parts of the internet. Right? And so there are some ratios, depending on people's usage patterns, not everyone's going to be using 50, uh, sorry, 100 megabits per second at, at any point in time. And so even though you, you're delivering, you can deliver a lot of bandwidth in the aggregate, maybe your backlink doesn't need quite as much bandwidth as, as if everyone was on at the same time. Again, that might also change. Um, if there are devices that are in fact on uh, all at the same time, or, for example, during the pandemic when everyone is using Zoom. And that's a huge, huge growth in bandwidth, uh, you know, just during the last year. And, I, you know, I haven't measured this. I wish I, wish I kind of did, but, you know, time. But I, I feel that my internet has improved pretty significantly in the last two months or so. So I think there was some upgrade that happened in Bozeman. <clears throat> All right, so that depends on uh, network topology. Uh, traffic demands um, you know of specific users and kind of communication patterns between users because it could be that a lot of people in bozeman are actually talking to other people in bozeman and so for some types of traffic um that traffic doesn't may not need to go to um you know to to the internet as a whole it may just kind of turn around within a particularly um within a a, a local autonomous system okay so with that, um, we can move into multimedia delivery, which is how um, a lot of video in particular, multimedia really mean uh, audio and video, though it can also, uh, most recently we would start caring about things like uh, gaming traffic, gaming, gaming traffic uh, or maybe eventually things like uh, VR or AR services. Um, virtual reality or augmented reality. Okay, so regardless of what you're going to transmit, it, it sort of breaks down into the audio component and the visual component. Um, 
<clears throat> right? So voice is encoded by sampling at a constant rate. We basically um, measure the voice, uh, the voice 8,000 times a second, and then quantize the, the pitch in some way. Um, and basically, if we, if we measure it eight times a second and we use eight bits uh, as quantization, meaning basically encoding the height of pitch at some value, that would imply 64 kilobits per second, right? Now, that doesn't change based on how many people are speaking, right? If all of you speak at the same time, I'm still, that voice is still going to get, you know, transmitted to, to some server and then combined into... Um, so many bits per second and then transmit it to me, right? I'm not actually getting streams from um, every one of you uh, because our communication goes to a server. Okay. The other thing is, the other thing we need to encode is video. So voice is easy, 64 kilobits per second is not a lot, but video is much more complicated. And for that, we need to do uh, some more clever encoding. So the PAL video format, which uh, probably no one remembers what that is, but that's how television was transmitted over the air a long time ago before we had digital television. And so basically you transmit 640 by 48 pixels, okay? And you, and you would use 24 bits uh, to encode each color. And then you would have something slow like 25 uh, frames per second. And once you multiply that out, you get 184 megabits per second, which is a lot, right? It's a lot. and that is just for uh, 480p, which is just like, you know, a, a tiny window at this point on our screens, okay? So you would get the super, this super inefficient coding because every bit was encoded directly. And that's um, why you needed, in, in part, so much bandwidth reserved for TV spectrum, right? If you guys remember when we looked at TV spectrum, analog or basically this level of this method of encoding uh, television was very, very bandwidth intensive. Okay. So what we need is some is some compression, right? Um, we would like to take the raw video, filmed hopefully higher at a higher resolution, right? Then encode it in some way. Uh, this is where the compression would would come in. Uh, put it in some storage, and then from that storage from those servers, there would be transmission over the network and a decoding of the encoded video and then playback, right? So that's generally the transmission. Uh, notably, there is storage in the middle of this. Um, ideally, we would also have fairly low end-to-end -end delay. Um, 60 milliseconds is, is pretty good, but that does need to include encoding and decoding, uh, which, which adds some time. And ideally, if this is stored data, we would like to have random access. Right? You may want to fast forward the video or pause it and then be able to resume it. Uh, so this is not television, this is stored uh, media. Okay, so um, let's get into how, how voice works, uh, voice encoding. So we have an uh, analog signal, which is encoded at some sample rate. So for telephone, it's fairly low quality. You would have 8,000 samples per second. For CD music, you would get to 44,000. Uh, 4,400 uh, samples per second, okay? And that means that basically uh, the pitch can change much more quickly over time. And right? so the way this works is we have uh, time during which the video is, uh, the sound is being played or encoded. And then the, the amplitude or basically the pitch of the sound. Okay? And we're going to sample that sound so many times per second. Okay, and at each sampling point, we'll basically pick or try to quantize the, the amplitude of the signal in some particular way. Okay. At any point though, there will be some error, right? Because we can look at the pitch at the start, we can look at the pitch at the end, we can look at the pitch in the middle of this, of this time period, but whatever we pick is gonna be off in some way. All right, so that's quantization error. Um, to do okay, and so basically we encode the this series of values, and then we send them to the uh, to the receiver, which basically plays out not the original audio, but kind of has these values, and uh, maybe before playback, it can do some smoothing to try to find a a, a pitch curve that kind of fits this. 
flashback to cock too. Cool. <laughs> we don't care about the integral though. Um, <clears throat> all right. So depending on how you sample this, right, you would have uh, uh, 1.4 megabits per second for uh, for CD. Uh, MP3 does a little bit more compression, uh, but basically taking out the very high and very low pitches, uh, and that gets you you know different versions of it uh, or different amounts of bandwidth. And then internet telephony would be something pretty low and higher if you have a, a better system. And but encoding audio is is pretty simple. Now, when we talk about interactive services, um, there is also this notion of quality of user experience. Right? If we encode, let's say, voice at uh, kind of the the fidelity of an of a telephone, and that sound you're encoding is a symphony, you're not going to get a very good playback. And if you want to know how awful it is, try to get on. Just get on hold with anybody, for example, an airline, and you will hear some awful music that is just so horrible to hear. I go back to times before all that where there will just be a beep every whatever 30 seconds that you are still on hold. I much prefer that. Um, anyway, so depending on the, on the encoding, you might get different quality experience, and this is true for video. This is true for... Uh, uh, this is true definitely for gaming. Um, it's true for file transfer, right? Everything eventually translates to some level of, of user satisfaction. And, and there are kind of different levels to this that depend on our human sensory system. So we, we've done some, some research on this uh, kind of when I first started at MSU and looking at other research, this is sort of where things break down. Okay? So if you're talking to somebody and there's more than 200 milliseconds of delay, there's a chance that one person will finish speaking and then both people will start speaking at the same time. And because you just take a pause and the other person thinks that maybe you finished speaking. And so uh, these pauses, if these pauses end up being forced to be about or over 200 milliseconds, these types of collisions are likely to happen. Where you end up in the situation, oh, no, you go, no, you go. <laughs> And then you kind of decide who gets to speak first. Okay. Um, below that, you're not really going to notice, but through measurement, people determine that if uh, latency is over 80 milliseconds, this tends to statistically shorten Skype sessions. So people don't really notice why, but if the connection is not that great. And so there is a statistical effect on shortening um, phone calls. Okay. Um, if you're latency is above 20 milliseconds, you will see a statistical impact on game scores. Which, again, you might not notice, 20 milliseconds is pretty good, right? It's, you wouldn't think it's horrible, but in effect, it does make you a worse player. So this is part of, part of my research. And then um, other people looked at uh, the causes of cyber sickness, and it turns out that if there's a delay more than five milliseconds between you turning your head and then the screen following, like in a VR setting, you're going to experience cyber sickness because uh, your inner ear is just much faster at, at recognizing the position of your head, uh, and it, it requires the, the kind of the you know what you see to catch up with that. Right. So, uh, quality of experience is often determined by just basically what how humans are built. Okay. Um, other types of thirst to quality could be things like jitter, which is kind of the variance in latency, um, loss of packets, which requires retransmission, or uh, in many cases, that just means no data arrives. Uh, some data doesn't make sense to be transmitted. For example, if you miss someone saying something, but you then keep hearing them, there's no sense retransmitting that bit of sound that you missed. Right? It's no longer relevant. It's not going to make sense to us. Right? And then uh, congestion could reduce uh, the amount of bandwidth that we're receiving right, and cause buffering. So um, our response to these is also going to be different based on the application uh, that we are uh, uh, that we're using. Okay? 
So here we have a level of satisfaction on the x-axis, okay? And we have worsening network conditions, uh, sorry, worsening network conditions on the x-axis and user satisfaction on the y-axis. So as network conditions get worse, for example, you get more loss or less bandwidth or more latency, okay? the user satisfaction with different types of applications is going to decrease. Now, the question for you guys is what types of applications might these curves uh, correspond to? I'm guessing the blue mark would be um, like video because at one point it's fine until it's just like unwatchable. Maybe. So the blue one, yeah, good. Okay, guess. Uh, it's a good interpretation of the curve. Right, where high satisfaction and it goes to low, that's actually voice. You can either deliver the requisite amount of bandwidth or you can't. That's, right? Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> All right. So then would the yellow one be, would the yellow or the green one be more related to video then? Because it's, it's like a constant decline over time or? Mm -hmm. The green yeah. one is actually video. Okay. Why, why is this, that, why this stepping? Video? Would that be buffering and then change of quality? Like if you're streaming a YouTube video, for instance, yes. it hits that, that point where it, it can't produce that much uh, quality anymore, then it drops the, the quality or it buffers? Uh, it, it has to do with the dropping of the quality. Okay. And if there's not yeah. enough bandwidth, you go to lower quality, and so your satisfaction is a bit lower. And... You know, it, it sort of goes so, down by the steps. So is that why, like, uh, YouTube uses auto quality most of the time on their videos? So it can automatically detect, or, uh, detect like, what your bandwidth is and then base it off of that? Exactly. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. From personal experience, red would be video gaming because <laughs> yes. that's pretty much the worst when you have any sort of <laughs> Yep, yep, exactly. Red is video gaming and yellow. Yellow is file transfer, right? We're, we're, we're pretty tolerant to just waiting a bit longer for files. Bulk transfer. Very good. Okay. So you guys mentioned buffering um, a, a bunch of times. And so here's kind of an illustration of, of the problem. <clears throat> so here we have cumulative data where you're delivering different chunks of the video stream or uh, different packets that correspond to the video stream, however you want to look at it, right? Um, and after, after transmission, those packets arrive at some delay. Okay? So even though you are maybe transmitting them at this constant rate, um, there is just a delay, the random delay that comes from the network, okay? So if you delay your play out of that of the data sufficiently okay? you're able to collect this data and then queue it for play out um, by issuing you know updated frames to your screen at a constant rate okay? but if you start the play out too early meaning you don't buffer enough okay? you can start the play out but you might run into situations where you want to do the play out but the requisite data hasn't arrived yet so depending on how variable your network delay is, or basically also how much bandwidth you have, because that's going to first govern it, but um, even if you have sufficient bandwidth to transmit the, the stream where you don't constantly fall behind, if your network delay is, is variable, then you will need to buffer and delay the amount of playout that you have. Okay, so if we're going to encode video, as you remember from the PAL example, um, we need to do some compression. 184 megabits per second for 640 by 480 is just not good enough. Um, so there are methods for encoding data in the network to save bandwidth, relying on the fact that there's often quite a lot of um, repetition in the data that we're transmitting. Okay? So there are different ways of encoding. There's lossless encoding examples or, or techniques, uh, runlet encoding, half encoding, arithmetic coding. There's a whole bunch of techniques there. 
Um, there's source coding, which uh, is uh, lossy, and um, there is some content prediction, or basically not encoding everything, you're kind of predicting what the content is going to be um, based on the content around it. And then there's hybrid encoding, um, which kind of combine the two, and that's what ends up being uh, put into these standards, such as JPEG for images uh, or the other ones for, for video transmissions. And let's look at some basics just to give you guys an idea. Yeah. So in runlet encoding, um, you have multiple uh, occurring bytes that are grouped together as the number of occurrences, some special characters, and a compressed byte. Okay. So for example, you can look at something like this and encoding as the number of occurrences. So for example, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight A's. Okay, so you can encode it as the number eight, a special character, for example, an exclamation point, and then the compressed byte, which is, which is the byte you're compressing, which is A. So this whole string could be converted to uh, eight bang A. Right. So a question for you guys is, what is the uh, compression ratio of, um, of this string? Meaning by kind of what ratio or percentage can you reduce the amount of bandwidth required to transmit this? And I'm gonna uh, switch my screens for a second here so I can get my uh, cheat sheet up. Hold up, I wanna show this to you guys. I need two screens. Uh, extend. Here's the question, can I, oh boy. Uh... Okay, here we go. Sorry, should have done this before. Give me one sec. All right, that worked, excellent. Okay, so back to the question. What is the compression ratio of, uh, uh, of this string?
All right, so you can basically reduce it to uh, the encoding would be 12 characters, would be 8 bang A, 3 bang B, 7 bang C, 2 bang D. Um, and so that's 12 out of 20, and so your compression ratio would be 40%. I think Mary F or had it in the chat there. Oh, sweet. Good job. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't see it. Awesome. Sorry. I thought you thought you saw that too, and I was like, I'm not really sure that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know. For some reason, the chat didn't pop up for me. Okay, cool. So uh, we can also look at uh, fixed length encoding, where we can encode the message using uh, N symbols. Okay, so maybe we're not using uh, the whole alphabet. We're just going to concern ourselves with the symbols that are in, used in the characters. Right? And so for that, we can say, that okay, um, we only have n symbols, okay, so we can encode them in binary using log two of n, okay, which is going to be basically three bits for the five symbols that we're using. So each symbol can only take uh, would only take three bits, okay, um, and so um, if you're using Eight bits per symbol for this. Okay, so you can kind of look compare the efficiency of this, right? So this encoding would take uh, what do we have? Twelve symbols at eight bits each because this is kind of the vanilla ASCII encoding. Okay, and uh, this encoding has twenty symbols for three bytes each. Okay, so this gives us this gives us sixty uh, bits, and this gives us 96 bits even even you know with this encoding and so for this example uh the fixed length encoding would be more efficient okay then we can get into um huffman encoding which is based on the statistical usage of the different symbols the most the more common symbols could we could agree to encode those using fewer bits Okay, so um, for example, we have, um, we're using these characters, okay? Uh, A, B, C, E, D, not sure why they're out of order. Uh, uh, maybe it has to do with something with the frequencies. I don't know, I don't remember where I yanked this from, but here's what happens. So the probability that one of these characters will be used is one, okay? Because all of these are used in, in our message. What we can then look at is the probability of the different combinations of characters, okay? And in some message, not the example I had before, in some message, we could say that um, B is the most common combination, right? Where the probability of B being in a, in a message used from this alphabet is 0.51, and the probability of any other character being used is 0.49. Okay, so we pick the highest probability combination, and the highest probability is just B. So that becomes kind of one uh, branch of our of our tree. Okay, and then we have the probability of uh, the other highest probability, which is the combination of all the other characters. Now we can break this down into the probability of CE and the probability of DA being the two highest. The probability of DA is the highest one. The second highest is the combination of the probability for CE. Okay. And so we can break that down further into individual characters. Okay. And from that we get we get our encoding from this tree. Okay. So to encode B, you would just use one because that's the path to reach that. To encode A, where is our A? Our A is here. You would look at your code would be zero, one, one. And so uh, you basically get this encoding for uh, from this tree. Okay. So um, you know if if you were looking at a set of characters in this message, or really the set of messages that you want to send, okay, let's say you have some protocol that you want to convert to binary, and you know kind of the the uh, 
the set of messages that you have and how prevalent those messages are. You can then find the prevalence of each symbol and based on that, build a tree and based on that, have encoding and then use those bits instead of, instead of the symbols. Okay. So, um, I don't think we have time to do this, but if you want to do this example, um, you can kind of assume that this is the only message you're sending and just look at those probabilities and compute your own, your own tree based on that. Okay. Um, so then we have kind of lossy encoding, which is a lot more uh, uh, powerful in terms of compression because you actually end up losing some information. And, and because you can lose it, you can um, kind of extrapolate it from the data that, that you have. So the two main techniques here are fast Fourier transform and discrete cosine transform. And I'm not going to get into the details of those, but the basic intuition behind it is that um, if you consider a list of numbers okay, and some characters, um, you may have a message that looks like something that looks something like that. From that, you can convert this into a frequency domain where first you're going to sort the list and then count the frequency of each of the numbers. Yeah, so you might come up with something like 4431. And that encodes the fact there are four uh, zeros in this in this message, and those would be represented here after the sort. Okay. And so, through this transformation, we lost the spatial order of of characters, but we captured their frequency. And okay. so, unfortunately, there's not a good way of converting back to this, but that's the intuition. We're taking uh, the spatial domain, converting it into the frequency domain. Now, fast Fourier transforms allow you to kind of convert stuff back. So you can take an original kind of sequence of numbers, uh, transmit those and code them in transmission, transmit those through DCT or FFT, which would be uh, these kind of uh, lists, right? So this sequence of numbers, and then you can push it through decoding and get something that approximates the original values or you know, better or worse. Right, um, and so you know, if you're looking, if you're looking at a sequence of numbers that's a, let's say, an encryption key, well, this wouldn't work, right? Because you would not get the original numbers back. For that, you would need to use a lossless encoding. Um, but if you're transmitting something like an image, and some of the cues are a little bit off, you might not even notice that. Right, and so that allows you to do, you know, a significant amount of compression. Right, we have what six numbers here, seven numbers here, uh, down to four. Right? Okay, and so basically, these types of systems, these types of lossy encoding is used in um, MPEG and JPEG formats. Okay, now when it comes to encoding uh, video, you can think of it, you can think of it as a series of images, but there's actually quite a lot of redundant information in the different frames of video that we want to transmit. And so it doesn't make sense to, even if you have a good compression algorithm, it doesn't make sense to try to encode the redundant information as well. Okay. So um, basically video has two um, uh, kinds of redundancy. One is spatial, where the redundancy is within an image, and one is temporal, where there is redundancy um, between the different frames. Okay? So if you look at spatial, right, there's a lot of kind of chunks here that are similar to each other, right? Or maybe there's a, a sequence of black here that's very similar to the sequence of black here. Okay? Um, and then temporal, you can see that from one frame to another, there's quite a lot of similarity in the structure of this image, right? Where this looks very much the same, maybe it's a little uh, recolored, but this area has changed quite a bit. Okay. And so what the way to encode the image is you can divide this um, into different types of frames. So the first kind of frame is an iframe where you get the image basically as a as a picture, right? It's basically a full a full JPEG. Right? And this has all the elements in it. Um, it kind of renders the whole screen. From there, you might get something like a P-frame, 
which basically takes a chunk of the image and changes it in some way, either recoloring or maybe moving it around. Okay, so here, even though the Pac-Man moves forward from the perspective of the screen, if the Pac-Man is kind of locked in this position in the screen, the dots move towards the Pac-Man. Okay? So we can kind of take that part of the image and move it, move it over. Okay? Now, the next type of frame is a B-frame, and the B-frame relies on the next I-frame. So in the next I-frame, we have a new dot, and we can kind of borrow it forward and place it in this image. Okay? So sometimes what you can see, if you have a downloaded and coded video, um, and you're watching it, once in a while, the frame will go, the whole picture will just go like gray, and then you'll get these weird colors. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Have you guys seen that? If you have, what's happening is that you missed the encoding of an iframe. So you were supposed to get a new, full new image of stuff and to kind of set your screen up. And then what's being encoded is the different changes to that screen. But if you miss the iframe, well, the B frames and B frames still arrive, but they basically just move stuff around that doesn't make sense anymore. And, and that's how that's how that encoding can get can get screwed up. Okay. So the way these different frames are then transmitted is you would have uh, an iframe or an intra frame, and then you might have a bidirectional frame, another bidirectional frame, and then a predicted frame. This goes back to this predicted frame here and this bidirectional frame here. Okay. So you would have uh, a number of um, these frames. And so as far as bit rate, right, this frame will take the most bandwidth. And then these might be, might take very little, and then you might have a predicted frame that takes a little bit more. Okay? So your stream might look like something like this. You have this sequence of frames. Okay? Those would be then put into um, kind of these video chunks, right? There would be an encoded uh, in these kind of bundles of video, followed by audio, followed by uh, control information. Okay? And then this would go into an IP packet. Okay? So the IP packets are transmitted at some interval. Okay? There would be an audio in each one of them because you need to deliver audio on uh, at some rate. And then you would have a number of these frames in a packet, allowing you to do video playback for some amount of time. And um, the last thing here is the variable variable rate encoding. Right? So when you're watching a video, you're pulling data from some content server through the internet, and then those frames, the frames here that needed that are needed for playback, are put into a buffer. Okay? And then you have some um, rate of arrival of these packets. You have some Q length at, at any particular time, and then you have some constant playout rate R. Okay? So what happens when the average arrival rate is lower than the playback rate? What would be the effect on, on the playback? Well, it'd have to buffer, right? It would just have to stop, <laughs> right? <laughs> because you'll never, you'll never catch up. Yeah, so sure. it would have to stop. Maybe eventually you transmit a frame. You have like you'd see one frame, and then you wait again, and then you see another frame, and you wait again, right? You basically wouldn't be able to so, to to sustain the the transmission rate, right? But if the arrival rate is on par or greater than playback, well, then you still need to buffer. Because we're talking about the average rate here, right? This goes back to that slide of you starting a playback too too early and not having all the data. Okay. So then, if the streaming rate is higher, is that why your video loads for a longer amount of time? So the higher yeah. the streaming rate is, the uh, uh, more video loads. Or... Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. And so to kind of deal with that and provide different people with you know, still good service, you have um, Dash or dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP, where 
We still send video in chunks as before, but now we have different types of chunks. Okay? So the server will advertise the, the available encoding rates through a through what's called a manifest. And so that's why when you click on a YouTube link right on the little cog, you can kind of select the different streaming rates or auto or whatever, right? Um, and then the server contains the video encoded at all these different rates. And your browser, depending on the amount of data in the buffer, will select different resolutions of the video. So if the buffer is full, your browser says, okay, cool, uh, or your, I guess not your browser, but your video playback application, right? Um, uh, if the buffer is full, it would say, oh, great, looks like I have sufficient X to the playback, I'm gonna start requesting higher quality video chunks. But if the buffer starts getting empty, okay, um, your client will start requesting lower quality data to be able to build up the buffer and never pause uh, the playback. So I think that's, yep. So um, does that, um, so this dash here, does that have uh, anything to do with some websites when you open up the website and there's a video, uh, the video won't load until there's a certain amount uh, in the buffer? Have you seen yes. that? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep, it's basically forcing there to be some buffer and kind of the amount of wait time, you know, it's trying to uh, it's trying to measure your your network speed to figure out when it can start playing back so that the buffer doesn't empty. Sure. Right. And some systems will start first loading low quality chunks to be able to start playback as soon as possible. And then while you're watching the video, the buffer builds up and the system says, oh, okay, maybe I can uh, juice it up a little bit and download some higher quality uh, frames. All right, so that's it for today. Um, nice and on time. Any questions? I don't think I'm okay. You guys are good. All right. Uh, um, this was fascinating content. I tell you that much. Was that? The stuff was very interesting. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. Makes me happy. Um, we'll all right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, to get anything that I missed. What's that? I'll definitely be watching the lecture to just make sure I get everything and cover any parts that I may or may not have missed. Or... Great. Look into the book too. The book does a good, does a fairly good job talking about this. Um, this is my area of expertise, the, the different encoding stuff. But uh, uh, there's a lot of work on that too, and I, I think it is very, very interesting if you if you're mathematically inclined. What chapter? Chapter nine, I think. All right. What did I have? Chapter nine. Uh, chapter eight. I'm sorry. Multimedia chapter eight. Chapter eight. Thank you. I had a question on your uh, graduate level networks class. Yes. Um, so. Does that class involve uh, programming assignments as well, or is it more theory based? And do we just dig more into how networks work and those kinds of things? Yeah, so that that class is going to be a little bit odd. I've been moving it more and more towards um, sort of applications um, and kind of doing network applications. So it's becoming more and more distributed systems. I actually wanted to switch it to distributed system implementation, but we just couldn't get it in time uh, for approval. So uh, it's gonna be a bit of a hybrid. I'll talk, I'll talk a, it's gonna be sort of a mix between advanced networking and distributed systems. Um, okay. Uh, but as far as the grading, um, there'll be, what's in it? There's definitely programming assignments. It's probably the bulk, the bulk of the work, just like in this class. Um, I, don't think that, I don't think there'll be any homework. There won't be any exams. Um, there will be probably uh, at least one research paper presentation. Okay. Right. So, Fantastic. and it's all going to be group based or individual, kind of whatever people want. Similar to how this class is set up. Though. Very similar. Very similar. Okay. There's minus homework, minus labs. Great. Cool. All right. Thanks. That answers my question. Great. All right. I'm guessing no class on Wednesday, right? Because the veterans day. 
<gasps> is that true? I think so. About it. I'm very excited. Hold up, let me double check. Like the day off. Is that true? Hold up, let me check the calendar. I actually have lectures scheduled. I guess I didn't mark it. Um, calendars, academic calendar. Yeah, no lecture on Wednesday. Yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean. Uh, that's, that's funny. <laughs> All right, I will see you guys on Friday. Thanks for the reminder. Making videos. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> See you Friday. All right. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Uh, actually, I actually had a question. Uh, I was he overhearing um, how the advanced networking class was kind of going to be a mix between um, that mm -hmm. and distributed systems. Yeah. I know there's been this distributed systems course in the past. Is there any um, uh, hopes of doing that again in the next couple of semesters? Or... Yes. Yes. So, um, uh, let me stop the recording here. Um...